1814, the British East India Company would confront one of its most daunting foes yet, the Empire of Nepal. At this point, the Nepali Empire was one of two roadblocks remaining, next to the Sikhs, for complete British dominance over the Indian subcontinent. This war, known as the Anglo-Nepalese War, or the Gurkha War, will see the gunpowder tactics of the British Empire come face to hilt with the Kukri Blade. What the Nepalese lacked in technology, they made up for in unbounded bravery, that when set loose, could cut down whole regiments of Napoleonic Age infantry. In this war, the British would learn the wrath of the Gurkha, and come to respect it. The Anglo-Nepalese War was not the first time that the East India Company showed interest in Nepal. In fact, they had been plotting from the very start. During the initial unification campaigns of Prithvi Narayan Shah, the British sent an expeditionary force led by one Captain George Kinlock in 1767. Here, the British got their first taste of Gorkhali might, as Kinlock's unit suffered an embarrassing defeat and was forced into retreat at the fortress of Sindholi. The British, having learned their lesson for a time, went back to conquering the rest of the subcontinent, leaving the Nepalese to carve out their own Himalayan empire. In 1788, the Gurkhas grew confident enough to attack their Tibetan neighbor, who was not only their most lucrative trade partner, but also a satellite state of the Chinese Qing Empire. The Qing let the Nepalese get away with their first invasion, but their second, in 1791, would not go unpunished. The Qing army cut Nepal in half and began to march on Kathmandu itself. Desperate and out of options, the Nepalese regent Bahadur Shah reached out to the British for guns, powder, and artillery. Captain William Kirkpatrick arrived in Kathmandu and presented Bahadur Shah with a treaty. The regent rejected the proposals under the rightful fear that the British would not be wholly honest with their agreement. Instead, Bahadur Shah came to a peaceful resolution with the Chinese. In a short eight years after this failed negotiation, the East India Company got their biggest breakthrough yet. The former king of Nepal, Rana Bahadur Shah, showed up at the British-controlled city of Varanasi. The exiled king desired to return to his throne and use any means necessary, even the British, to achieve this. The East India Company instead used him as a pawn to enter Nepal in a more subtle manner. Over the course of Rana's four-year stay in Varanasi, two treaties were signed between Nepal and the East India Company. All the British had to do was keep Rana Bahadur Shah on house arrest. The latter treaty even led to the first British resident to arrive in Kathmandu, William Knox. All was going well, as the East India Company slowly and diplomatically probed themselves into Nepal. That is, until Resident Knox was caught in a plot to overthrow the acting Queen Regent. From here, he was put on house arrest and eventually left Nepal, his mission proving to have been a failure. Again, the EIC and the Kingdom of Nepal parted ways, each continuing in their own regional conquest. In 1811, a small country called Butwal, on the border between Nepal and British India, came into the spotlight of both nations. The Nepalese annexed the kingdom in 1811, ignoring or ignorant to the fact that the British already claimed Butwal under their protection. Soon after the annexation, Nepali and British diplomats met to discuss a peaceful solution. No resolution would be found as, from the start, the East India Company representatives were extremely rude and demanding of the Nepalese. Both parties walked away, the Nepalese feeling insulted and the British cheated. Tensions continued to rise until 1814. The Governor General of India, Lord Francis Hastings, declared war on the Kingdom of Nepal giving five generals a combined 22,000 British regulars alongside some 100,000 native sepoys. With the clear numbers advantage, Hastings left all the strategy of conquering the most mountainous country on earth to his cabinet of experienced generals. 
Both sides held major advantages and disadvantages before the onset of total war. One, and most obviously, Nepal was a land of cliffs and mountains. The altitude alone would impact the effectiveness of the British army. Nepal's disadvantage, which the British wished to exploit, was the overexpansion of the quickly built empire. The Nepali kingdom was so skinny that it could easily be cut in half, and from there, into a million pieces. The British obviously had the numbers advantage as well as the technological advantage. This, however, would be negated by the fact that the British didn't have the home field advantage and would be susceptible to ambush, where guns would no longer matter. And in close quarters, the Kukri beats the bayonet, and the Gurkha beats the Brit. The five British generals that Hastings entrusted the campaign to were as follows. In the far west, Major General David Octorlane. Born in colonial Massachusetts, Octorlane came from a long line of Scotsmen serving in the British Army. At the age of 18, he joined the military as a cadet and was transported to India for the first time, whereafter he would spend the vast majority of his life. He had fought Tipu Sultan in the Mysore War and was present when the British conquered Delhi from the Marathas. Hereafter, Lieutenant Colonel Octorlane was named as the British resident of Delhi, where he would win renown for defending the city with a small corps of British soldiers. In 1814, just before the start of the Anglo-Nepalese War, Octorlane was appointed to Major General. Stationed just east of Octorlane was General Robert Rollo Gillespie. Born an Irishman, Rollo, as he was commonly known, joined the Irish cavalry at 19, killed a man in a duel at 23, and was known as the strongest man of Comer by 24. A well-traveled man who first found his post in the Caribbean before coming to India in 1806, stopping a wide-scale mutiny on the way. In 1811, the now Major General Rollo Gillespie commanded the main force during the invasion of Java. This Dutch colony was successfully taken by Gillespie and his comrades by 1812, Rollo having shown suicidal bravery. Further east from Gillespie and about halfway between Kathmandu and Joomla was Major General John Sullivan Wood. General Wood joined the army at 21, serving for a long period in England before finding a command in the Caribbean. In 1808, he was transferred to India. Of all generals present, John Sullivan Wood was probably the most inexperienced, not in years, but in true battle. Lined up directly facing Kathmandu was Major General Bennett Marley, who, after this campaign, the British military tried to forget. For reasons that will soon become obvious, not much information on his life excluding the Anglo-Nepalese War has survived. In the Far East was Major General Ladder, who was given the dual assignment of protecting the small country of Sikkim and convincing its king, Shugfud, to an alliance with the British Empire. General Ladder saw no major action and was successful in his courting of Shugfud. The British, having focused their most battle-proven commanders in the Western theater, made their first move there. Unsurprisingly, the first to strike was the brave general, Rollo Gillespie, who started his march in the direction of Nalapani Fortress in October of 1814. With a little over 3,500 men, General Gillespie approached Fort Nalapani, which was still being built. It sat at the top of a 600-foot hill that was blanketed in thick vegetation. Inside, the defenders consisted of some 600 Gurkha, led by the son of a Nepalese governor named Balahadra Kunwar, a man of only 25 years and exceptional perseverance. On October 30th, the British marched themselves and their artillery up the hill that Nalapani rested on. Finding no resistance as they set up their cannons and opened fire on Halloween Day of 1814, a day before the war officially began. 
The first assault on the fort would follow the initial bombardments. Gillespie split his forces into four groups that would storm Nalapani from four different spots on the walls that were identified as weak points. However, the attack was doomed from the start. Due to a miscommunication, only two of the four columns attacked the walls. And due to the irregular shape of Fort Nalapani, which was constructed to match the mountain that it sat on, the Nepalese cannons could be positioned in such a way that they could fire at British soldiers scaling the walls, while still being out of eyesight for the opposing artillery. From atop the walls, the Gurkha's bows proved more than effective, as women and children began hurling stones from the ramparts. With Nalapani proving a death trap, the two attacking columns began to fall back. When General Gillespie saw this, he decided to personally enter the battle himself. Showing his trademark bravery, he led three regiments to a spot about a hundred feet away from the fort. Standing tall, he waved his red hat vigorously in the air, gesturing for his men to storm the fort. Gillespie shouted, One shot more for the honor of the dead. At this moment, he was shot through the heart and died before he hit the ground. Next in line to the chopping block was Colonel Sebright Mobby, who made the wise decision to withdraw for a few weeks and recover. After receiving reinforcements, the British started a day and night bombardment on November 25th. The artillery barrage only ended three days later, when a huge section of Nalapani's northern wall collapsed. Colonel Mabe pounced on the opportunity and sent most of his men to the hole in the wall. When the Brits approached, the Nepalese charged out, Kukri in hand, filling the gap in the wall and forcing the Redcoats into a retreat. This was repeated later that day, with even worse results for the British. And later that night, an attempt was made to conceal the soldiers using smoke, but this was also thwarted by the Gurkha. After this, and with 800 men dead or wounded, Colonel Mabe gave up on attacking the fortress, deciding to starve it out instead. Fort Nalapane was surrounded, its water source and nearby pond was found and also surrounded. Colonel Mabe ordered for the artillery to be fired directly into the center of the fort targeting warriors and civilians alike. This bombardment also destroyed the water reserves that were left in the fort, leaving the situation dire for the Gurkha. They had three days to decide on dying of thirst or from battle. By November 30th, most of the remaining 84 Gurkha pledged a fight to the death, hopefully giving some a chance to escape. The Gurkhas who refused the suicidal charge were dragged out of the fort by their comrades until there was no turning back. Here, the Gurkha cut a hole straight through the British lines and 50 of them, including Balabhadra Kunwar, made a run for it. No one could stop them. Upon entering the ruins of Nalapani Fortress, the British were greeted by putrid smell and hundreds of corpses that were left to rot where they fell. This is the lengths that the Nepalese would go to to protect their homeland. Here at Nalapani, the British truly learned the wrath of the Gurkha. Next to strike the Nepalese was the combination of General John Wood and Major General Bennett Marley. Together, these two would march on the Nepali heartland of the Kathmandu Valley. If successful, this march would put a swift end to the war. The British soldiers crossed the border into Nepal, expecting an easy march until reaching the mountains. Instead, the Gurkha pounced. The brother of Bimzan Thapa, the undisputed leader of Nepal, was given the goal of protecting the Kathmandu Valley at all cost. His name was Ranabir Singh Tapa, and he decided it better to not wait for the British, and took his defense into an offensive. If they never even saw the mountains that the Kathmandu Valley rested in, then there would be no threat at all to the capital. When Ranabir saw the main British army approaching, he lured the eastern portion into a killing field. 
4,000 Gurkhas appeared from the woods and streamed from the hills as General Marley's regiment was decimated by close quarters combat and fled in fear of the Kukri. When General Marley regained his army's composure, he decided to end his days of commanding soldiers. So many had died due to his mistake and the Gurkhas would fill any reasonable man with fear. So Bennett Marley removed his uniform and left the camp, deserting the British army in the midst of war. Meanwhile, the army of General John Wood, who was marching side by side with Marley, was made frozen by his utter defeat. After doing some advanced scouting, General Wood continued his march into the interior of Nepal. Soon enough, he too found himself in an ambush. The son of the esteemed general, Nayan Singh Tapa, who had died five years previously in the Nepali Sikh War, Ujir Singh Tapa, had dealt a big enough blow to General Wood's force for him to retreat and take up a defensive position. Ujir was a master of mountain warfare and frequently used psychological warfare to harass the British, leaving signs of his presence all around the British camp. General Wood, unlike Marley, did not desert, but like Marley, he was terrified of the Gurkha. Where Marley's response was flight, Wood's was to freeze. He remained inactive and on the defensive for the remainder of the war. Where flight and freeze had taken hold of the eastern British armies, fight was still the order in the west. More specifically, the army that was previously under the leadership of General Gillespie was continuing their push, replacing the brave Gillespie with one Major General Martindale. They restarted their march from Nalapane in December of 1814, taking the town of Nahan without a fight. Looking up from this settlement, 3,600 feet up, and in the middle of a ridge that was connected by two mountains, was the fortress of Jaithok. How do you besiege this? General Martindale split his forces into two, on either side of the ridge that Jaithak sat on, while Martindale observed from Nahan. On the southern side of the ridge was stationed Major Ludlow and a thousand men. On the northern flank was Major Richards and 800 men, who on Christmas night marched 14 miles uphill just to get into position. At these altitudes, the Gurkha, who had grown up in the clouds, were like superheroes, as the gravity sat heavy on the seafaring British. The pair of Majors set up their artillery and fired on the Nepalese fort, their cannon shots falling mostly ineffective as they had no reasonable position to fire from. On the night of December 27th, the two-pronged British assault began. The first to attack was Major Ludlow on the southern ridge. While the fortress of Jaithak would have been a monster to besiege, they first had the task of even getting there. The whole way they would be forced to contend with obstacle after obstacle, as the Gurkha gave no quarter, not even at night. The commanding Gorkali officer inside the fort was the son of Nepal's lead general, Amar Singh Tapa. His name was Ranojir Singh Tapa, and his defense of Jaitak would prove that father was just like son. Major Ludlow advanced for three hours on the southern ridge before encountering the Gurkha forward scouts, who fled and alerted the rest. Seeing this, Major Ludlow gave chase and ran his men up a hill to chase the scouts. At the top of this hill was a small and seemingly deserted village and temple. Upon approaching, the settlement quickly showed its life as the Gurkha shot one volley at the British before again retreating up the ridge. Major Ludlow occupied the temple. Here, he was assigned to wait for Major Richard's signal to continue the assault. However, the allure of glory made Ludlow abandon the plan. Small fires and a fence could be seen in the distance in a particularly unimpressive position. There was no time to wait while the enemy was so weak. In charge of the fence that lined the ridge was another member of the Tapa clan, this one being Jaspo Tapa, who was the second in command at Fort Jaithak. Little did the British know 
the trap they were entering. Most of the 1,000 Gurkha inside Jythak had hidden themselves just behind the fence and in a small crevasse. As the British neared the stockade, all was quiet. Suddenly, they were shot upon by seemingly all directions. As flanking the fence on both sides, the Nepalese gunmen emerged from the slopes of the ridge and made for a deadly crossfire. After two volleys, Jaspo Tapa ordered for his hiding Gurkha to chase the British back down the mountain. After four hours of running from the mountaineers, Major Ludlow and his exhausted army arrived back in Nahan by 10 a.m., having not slept for more than 24 hours. As Major Ludlow returned to base camp defeated, Major Richards on the northern ridge was only starting to get into position. Taking up a spot on the northern ridge that overlooked Fort Jythak, Richards waited for Ludlow's signal, but it never came. All the while, the ledge of the British northern flank came under constant attack by the Gurkha, who could now focus their full attention onto him. Over the course of that day, the Nepalese charged the British lines nine separate times, leaving the Europeans extremely low on ammo, and in a state of desperation, they started throwing stones at the Gurkha. Major Richards held out until sunset. There, he knew that reinforcement would never arrive, nor would Major Ludlow. He started his retreat at dusk, and over the course of that night of retreat, over a hundred British were killed by the Gurkha, or from the landscape itself, as many preferred the fate of freefall than Kukri. The British remained at Nahan for the next two months as General Martindale planned for another attack. Sometime in February, he realized that this was, in fact, impossible, and retreated south to Nalapani. A little over 500 British regulars and sepoys were killed or wounded during this poorly planned offensive. In the far west of Nepal, the situation was much different. There was no major Nepalese generals assigned to the provinces as they were left to fend for themselves, with only 500 Gurkha given to them, alongside the local inhabitants. The governor of the province furthest to the west just so happened to be Bam Shah, a cousin of the boy king, Girvan Yara Bikram Shah. Why was a member of the Shah ruling family planted in the periphery province with near no support? Well, the thing about King Girvan Shah was that he was a puppet. Getting his adult cousins as far away from the throne as possible was a great move by Bimzan Tapa. Leaving them for dead to face a whole British army was a way for Bimzan to fight his enemy and also eliminate his rivals. Bam Shah, all combined, had about 1,400 soldiers, most of which were not Gurkhas but native Kumanonans. His province was completely overrun by 5,500 British under Major General David Octor Lane and his commanding officers. Bam Shah did all he could and strategically chose his targets, giving battle to Captain Hearsay and his 500 men, defeating and taking him prisoner. Being so outnumbered, Bam Shah was forced into retreat for weeks, trying and failing to find more weak points in Octor Lane's lines. With his back in a corner, he called his brother, Hastadal Shah, who was the neighboring governor, for assistance. Hastadal Shah could only muster another 500 men to assist his brother, but they would never reach him. Hastadal was ambushed and seconds into the ensuing battle, he was killed, thus ending the life of one of the few Shah family members still in a position of relative power. In late April of 1815, the walls of Bam Shah's stronghold fortress of Almora were blown to smithereens by British cannon, and he surrendered soon after, leaving the province of Kumon to the British and handing them their first win, albeit a small one. With the far west fallen, the living tiger of Nepal was finally awakened. Amar Singh Tapa, the highest ranking general in the Nepalese army, marched west, on a collision course with General Akhtar Lane. 
Allowing the British to keep their gains earned from the Shahas, Amar Singh Tapa stationed himself on the new borderland in Garhwal, where, only a few years previous, Amar had conquered the kingdom of Garhwal itself, their king dying in the battle. Amar hoped this campaign would mirror the former. Wasting no time, the tiger took the initiative and sought out Akhtarlane's army. Finding them in March of 1815 and executing a perfectly planned battle, where 3,000 Gurkha outflanked and nearly surrounded a force that was almost twice their size. However, Akhtarlane got away, his force defeated and frightened, but still mostly intact. So far, out of the six British generals leading this campaign, one was dead, one deserted, two were defeated, and one was scared into submission. Only one of the six generals is actually fulfilling his role, and that was General Ladder in Seacombe, and he wasn't even supposed to fight anyone. If something didn't change soon, this campaign would stall into an embarrassing British defeat. General Octorlane, having been the only general to find a smidgen of a victory against the Gurkha, was given the overall command of the British forces. After his defeat, he waited for reinforcement from Delhi, bringing with them many pieces of artillery with a range that far exceeded the cannons he had originally had. This was all part of the plan. Octorlane realized that every British general over the course of the campaign had played directly into Nepal's hand. The British were overconfident and unprepared for the guerrilla tactics of the Gurkha. If he was going to beat Nepal, then he needed to use a tactic completely foreign to the East India Company. He needed to slow down. Slowing down the British advance and taking a more methodical approach would eliminate the element of surprise and terrain that the Nepalese depended on. This proved a far better strategy as Octorlane's 10,000 soldiers inched their way down Nepal. Eventually, they reached the Nepali version of the Maginot Line, a series of fortifications in western Nepal that were centered around the impenetrable fortress of Jaithak and Malan, where the tiger and his cub made their dens. Although the two forts were impervious to siege, Octorlane identified but one weakness, a crest on a neighboring mountain that if the British could establish themselves on, could fire down on both castles. The British began to set up their camp and artillery on this ridge, called Diothal. That is, until a Gorkali war cry consumed the mountainside, and an old but virulent man charged straight towards the 3,500 British. Bakti Tapa, one of the oldest members of the Tapa clan, met with the Marsing Tapa soon after learning the British plans to take Diothal Ridge. Bakti Tapa, a man in his 74th year, was prepared to do what no one else would. He was going to climb Diotho and take that ridge back, or he was going to die trying. He, of all the commanders, had the least to lose. His years being numbered, he gave the only thing that was left to lose to Amar Singh Tapa, his grandson which Amar promised to raise as his own in the likely event that Bhakti Tapa did not return. Alongside 400 brave Gurkhas, Bhakti Tapa marched towards sweet victory and or death. At 3.15 a.m. on April 17th, the Gurkha began their march, on pace with a steady and foreboding beat of a drum. The British had fully entrenched themselves at Diotho and the surrounding area putting any battle heavily in the favor of the invaders. Bakti Tapa, who had been born since before the unification campaigns of Nepal had even begun, charged the British battlements, Kukri in hand, alongside a small shield. Showing incredible speed for his age, he cut down several British soldiers before taking a kill shot at the end of a cannon. The remaining Gurkhas fought until they were all dead were unable to continue. Once the battle was over, the British saluted their fallen foe, returning the body of the brave Bakti Tapa to Malan Fort. Upon seeing the body of his old cousin, 
Amar Singh Tapa knew that his position was doomed. The British would rain hellfire on him and his son any day if they did not surrender their post. In late October, Amar Singh Tapa surrendered the forts of Malon and Jaitak, saving himself and his son from the fate of Bhakti Tapa. With this, Western Nepal had fallen to the British, and defeat for the Gurkha appeared inevitable. After the surrender of Western Nepal, the British sent a treaty to Kathmandu. Bimzan Tapa was willing to concede defeat and give up some things to the East India Company. But the proposed treaty would leave Nepal as a shell of its former self that would need to fully rely on British India. Bimzan Thapa was given 15 days to accept or face continued invasion from General Akhtar Lane. The Mukhtiar did not write back and hostilities resumed on November 28th of 1815, nearly a year since the war had begun. General Wachter Lane was given even more soldiers, nearing 20,000 men, as he continued his eastward push towards Kathmandu. In his way was another defensive line. This time, there were five fortresses that all fell easily, besides one. Outside of Hariharpur Gadi, the Nepalese showed their last brave action of the war, as Ranojiya Singh Tapa, the son of Amar, gave a massive battle to the British. Unfortunately, after a time, he was outmaneuvered and forced back into the fort, soon after, surrendering his position once more. Akhtar Lane's horde was unstoppable. The only thing halting his advance was history. The general decided to stop where the British had first lost to the Gurkhas, the fortress of Sindhuli, where Captain George Kinlock was chased out of Nepal. Akhtar Lane decided to make camp a few thousand yards away, waiting for a new treaty to be signed and ratified. Nepal, now in no place to make demands, accepted the Treaty of Saguli on March 4th of 1816. A third of Nepal's lands would be taken and annexed by the British and her ally. The Nepalese would lose all of Sikkim to Shugfud, who would go on to be the longest reigning king in Sikkim's history. The region of Butwal, that had started this conflict in the first place, would be split east and west between the East India Company and Nepal. In the west, the new boundary would be the Mechi River as Nepal lost Garhwal and Kuman. Not only land did the British take, but also influence, as they had before the British set up a resident in Kathmandu, who was supposed to influence the politics of Nepal in favor of the British Empire. And just like before, the resident would be put on nothing more than a respectful house arrest. To compensate for these demands, the EIC promised to pay an annual of 200,000 rupees to Nepal, which they actually followed suit in doing. While the Anglo-Nepalese war had ended, relations would never be the same after, because for a change, they would improve drastically. After witnessing the wrath of the Gurkha personally, General David Octorlane saw an opportunity. With permission from Governor General Hastings, Octorlane began recruiting the Gurkha into their own infantry unit, separate from local auxiliaries. The 1st Regiment would evolve into one of the Royal Army's greatest assets, the Gurkha Rifles. Although evolved and modernized from their 18th century style of warfare, the Gurkha remained the same invincible killing machine through the World Wars and beyond. Refusing to put down their Kukri, Every Gurkha today still carries their trademark weapon. One story to summarize them all about the respect shared between the Gurkha and the British Redcoats is a little story I like to call Cannon Jaw. While the British were bombarding the fort of Nalapane, a lone Gurkha approached the lines, making peaceful gestures. Upon nearing, the British realized that his jaw was nearly torn off by a cannonball. The commanding officer immediately granted all the medical aid he could, and the man recovered. When he was ready to leave the medical tent, he made it clear to the captain that he was going to rejoin the enemy army inside Nalapani. The British officer allowed him. They shook hands, 
and went back to killing each other. Four days after the Treaty of Saguli, the boy king under the thumb of Bimzantapa came of age. Girvan Shah was finally in no need of a regent, but the king now held only a ceremonial role, as long as there was a Muktiar. In a short six months, Girvan Shah died mysteriously, likely on the order of Bimzantapa. He left behind a three-year-old son, and for the third time in a row, the kingdom of Nepal would be inherited by a babbling baby. The Anglo-Nepalese War finally put an end to the wars of the Gurkha and the fall of Greater Nepal. Although the British did return Eastern Terre to Nepal in 1860, in a short 68 years from 1743 to 1811, the tiny kingdom of Gorkha grew to create the largest empire ever to be seen in Nepali history. As has been displayed time and time again, the reason the Gurkha were able to do this came down to one thing. The fact that they were Gurkha, some of the bravest and deadliest soldiers in history. While the Gurkha were more than capable of conquering their neighbors, running a stable government was not their forte. In the years following the great founder, Prithvi Narayan Shah, the Shah kings were either paranoid, psychotic, or babies. Nepal was ruled solely by a king for only a total of six out of 41 years until 1816. The weakening and eventual disregard for the Shah dynasty held the kingdom of Nepal back from even more expansion. Had Prithvi not died in his early 50s or Pratap his 20s, had Rana never been born, and if Girvan was not so young, then who knows what greater Nepal could have looked like. To conclude on the unification and fall of Greater Nepal, I will end with the wise words of Prithvi Narayan Shah. Just before his death, when he knew his time was limited, he compiled a book called the Divyopadesh. The main marks of this book are as follows. Remain close allies to the Chinese and ignore the British East India Company as much as possible. Over the years, Nepal did the complete opposite of what Prithvi had suggested, and look what happened. While he was no time traveler, even the founding father of Nepal knew the fragility of the nation that he had just created. But that is just the will of the Gurkha. Fight, even when you can't win, and just maybe we can make and preserve the dream and reality that is Nepal.